did save your life. That is what happened. The Walking Dead is back. The ones who live in the, the Walking Dead is really, really so black, static, though. Us included. And I think it I really for all is black. It's weird. The original series ended, but there's like more Dixon, Walking Dead Maggie, now. It's Nathan. insane. I'm also excited to see Rick it doesn't make with the sense. Young actress who plays Judith and him getting to meet his son, Rick Jr., for the first time. But I have to say, after this episode, I'm starting to wonder if deep down Rick ever really wants to go back home. Or that's what I thought as well, my friend. That's what I thought as well how this episode's season one reference may have just teased a classic Walking Dead love triangle. Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and these are all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, episode three. We open with a title card that reads, Years Ago, giving us a glimpse back to Rick's time at the CRM during the early years of him being taken away. We see Rick reunite with Jadis for the first time. God, I still don't like her. She took him away in the helicopter. God, I don't like her anymore. Now, I know one. this scene is taking place prior to the Walking Dead spin-off series World Beyond because Jada still has her long hair like she did in Walking Dead. I keep forgetting she was in the World Beyond. Because I didn't watch that show. Has his boots that Michonne would find later. Rick puts together pretty quickly that Jada traded Rick in exchange for a life in the city. Why aren't you working consignment? It's me. I still don't get why though. Why was he worth so much to them? That she she just got to bypass all of the slave labor that, that the others had to do and she just had a life. I still don't get that. doesn't make sense. Because she gave them a person. Could, didn't she like give, give them access to a lot of people? Didn't make sense. Back in the original series, when Jadis was leading a group called the Scavengers, she would capture and trade people to the CRM in exchange for supplies. We got a tease of that here in the season 7 finale, when Jadis and the Scavengers betrayed Rick because Negan made a better deal. We had a deal. Samuel came for the boat things, followed ones who took a better deal. Right here in earshot of Rick, Jadis and Negan negotiate the amount of people that Negan will give Jadis in exchange for helping bring down Rick. Deal is for 12, yes. 10. Negan then says, Whoa. Echoing the line of his old friend Croat that we'd meet later in Dead City. People are resource. resource. It's actually insane how much in the original Walking Dead series, the CRM, I don't know if it's intentional, Or unintentional, it was so teased the whole time. Teased throughout, little Easter eggs. It is actually insane. Considering The Walking Dead started in 2010 and CRM weren't fully shown until I think 2020. There is no way anyone does that long term planning. I tell you all this because when Jada says, Hi, Rick. We see a flashback to that episode where Jadis is holding Rick at gunpoint as she turns him over to Negan. And if you look closely, you can see Carl wearing Rick's sheriff hat right here in the bottom right, surrounded by Negan's savior goons. So Rick was Jadis's final trade, and trading Rick secured her a spot within the ranks of the CRM. Rick is understandably pissed, but Jadis adamantly insists that she saved Rick's life. And remember, Rick wasn't just thrown into the water after the explosion at the bridge. Earlier in that episode, he was bucked off his horse and landed Landed on this piece of rebar. And guys, you may have noticed that we are releasing these breakdowns before the episode airs on AMC. No, that but that still doesn't make any sense. Because we saw in that where she would negotiate it with Negan for like 12 people. So, and she, she identified Rick as a B, not as an A. So why was he worried that much? That still doesn't make sense to me. Not at all. Because episodes of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, drop early on AMC+. Plus. Yeah, you movie. have an AMC, AMC Plus, Plus sponsor. Movie. That is cool, okay? Plus. Stop and making me jealous. The Ones Who Live hours before anyone else, which is the best way to avoid spoilers on social media. So, Jada saying, But I did save your life. Echoes back to her line to Rick as he regained consciousness in the helicopter. I'm gonna save you. Jadis then explains to Rick that the CRM has a 500 year plan to restore society back to the way it was before the world fell. This place has a 500 year plan to recreate the world as it was better than it was. Here we see anyone that, that's arrogant in their ability, that thinks that they're freaking gods, that they can plan for 500 years in the future, you should run to the other side. Because if someone is that so full of themselves to think that they'll be here in 500 years, yeah, I don't want to be associated with them. 
Ithorne crying over the death of Akafor, showing how much he meant to her and how she has truly become part of the CRM and their mission. Are you here, Rick? Are you a part of this? The previous episode left off with Jadis in Rick's apartment asking him, Rick, what the f are you doing? Jada says how Rick and Michonne together are capable of anything. This echoes the Ones Who Live teaser in the Walking Dead series finale, where Rick says that he, Michonne, and the others are unstoppable when together as one. One unstoppable life. You showed me that. Jadis threatens Rick and promises that if he and Michonne try to escape, she'll tell the CRM all about Alexandria to see to it that they are all killed. So I would have to go and kill all of you. This was your mess. In the event of my untimely demise, I just put a little file among my possessions. If you try with her, everyone back home dies. Why? When Rick asks Jadis to make a deal, we're once again getting a call back to the season seven finale. When Rick says to Jadis, We can make another deal. Last episode, we talked about how Michonne calls Judith Shoto over the radio and how Shoto means short sword in Japanese, a reference to Judith's small samurai sword. Michonne refers to herself as Daito, which means long sword in Japanese. Shoto, it's Daito. Here on this wall, we see Grime 68. Now, this is the high score of walkers killed in a single shift, and that title belongs to Walker Slayer Officer Friendly, Rick Grimes. Now, this might be a stretch, but I may have found some significance behind that number. In issue 68 of the Walking Dead comics, we meet Aaron. Aaron was the character who would bring Rick and the survivors to the Alexandria safe zone. So, the use of the number 68 could be a wink and a nod to Rick and Michonne joining a new group in the comics, and both now being with the new group, the CRM, in this spin off series there's also well, i think that's a, that's a bit of a stretch but it actually is a connection that makes sense as well so i am hypoc i am arguing with myself at that point but it's actually a nice connection i doubt it's that why it's for that reason but well, makes sense. Episode 68 of the Walking Dead TV series titled First Time Again. This episode showed Rick in his new role as the co-leader of Alexandria. And that title, First Time Again, could be a reference to how in this episode... So Rick episodes, so the number 68 is associated a with a lot of new beginnings in the Walking Dead world. Become strangers. At Akafor's funeral, we hear Major General Beale talk about this sword that belonged to Hugh Mercer. Mercer had different lives, landed on the right side in the fight against the British. And he died in that fight. I believe you can draw a straight line between his sacrifice and Donald Okafor's sacrifice. Hugh Cap. Mercer was a Scottish-American doctor and a military general during the Revolutionary War, where he joined the fight for freedom and independence. It's ironic to hear Major General Beale admiring Hugh Mercer and the Revolutionary War when he oversees a military force that doesn't allow its people to be truly free. And guys, I'm calling it right now. We better see Michonne and Beale get into an epic sword fight before this season ends. Beale so, uh, also sorry to disappoint. That he found this sword during the Battle of Filter Square. That's Filter Cap. Square is actually a park in Philadelphia, and it is named after a former mayor of Philly. This battle for Filter Square must have been one of Beale's early battles when the CRM secured Philadelphia as part of their three-city alliance. Beale calls Rick an ancient Greek word, pharmakon, meaning both poison and the cure. What Beale means by this remark is that he sees Rick's potential as a major that, asset oh, for the CRM. Oh, he has and no idea how facts that actually is. Rick is the cure and poison in so many ways throughout his entire existence. How Rick's strength and determination could serve the CRM well. But that same strength and determination are what makes Rick dangerous. He cannot be ruled, and that is the poison. You see, Rick is an A. But I also wonder if Rick being called the poison and the cure could be a hint at a long time Walking Dead theory coming true. The theory that Rick Grimes is immune to the Walker virus. Now, no. Now? Well, in both the comics and the Ow. TV series, fans have speculated that the reason we follow Rick Grimes is because he will be the key to saving the world, both through his leadership, no but way. also by being the key to curing the no virus. Way. Beale gives Rick this book called Martial Arts and the Book of Family Traditions by Yagyu Minenori. This book is sometimes confused with Sun Tzu's The Art of War. The book That's breaks down Big differential. Martial arts and military conflict. It also discusses the responsibility one holds when wielding a sword, a reference to both Beale and Michonne. and Michonne. This could also be meant to symbolize the responsibility that Rick feels that he owes to the world through the CRM, but more on that in just a bit. In the book, we see a rivalry between two men with swords. Hopefully, this is foreshadowing that epic duel between Michonne and Sorry Beale. to disappoint you again. Writings, you'll learn that his philosophy deems killing as evil, but he introduces a justification for killing in regards to the life-giving 
sword. It may happen that a myriad of people suffer because of the evil one. In such a case, a myriad of people are saved by killing one man. Would this not be a true example of the sword? So that's the that's the justification of would you take a life to save uh, like a hundred lives? Or that stupid, uh, stupid way to phrase it is like, would you kill baby Hitler if you had the chance? Because that is a, this is, this is an argument that you know, if you kill one person to save a hundred, is that justified killing? This is the life, the sword of life, in a way that is true. But some people would still argue against it. It's a justif, it's a justification of murder, but it's justified murder. So also, you could say if Batman just. Well, killed the Joker freaking ages ago, how many people would still be alive? is the sword that gives life. This quote on justification for killing if it benefits the greater good perfectly represents what Beale and the CRM military feel their mission is. They think they are saving the world. And by killing strong-willed leaders who they classify as A's, they feel like they are saving the B's, aka the majority and rebuilding society by ruling with an iron grip. This justification of killing a few to save the many is also seen in the group that Nat came from. We don't stop. Trying to save two, we could lose 200. These justifications for trading lives have never been how Rick and Michonne operate. Back in season three of the original series, the governor offered Rick a deal where if Rick gave him Michonne, the governor promised to spare everyone else's lives. If we give the governor Michonne, Woodbury stands down. But Rick, of course, made the right decision and rejected the governor's offer. We're not leaving. Down in the subway tunnels, Rick sees a message written on the ground that reads, Tell them I'm sorry, with a dead body lying next to it. This echoes Rick's letter from the beginning of the first episode of this series, where he too was apologizing for failing to get back home, all while contemplating taking his own life. It also parallels this scene from The Walking Dead pilot. Glory, Carl. I'm sorry. This is also foreshadowing Damn, that's Rick hard. won't be leaving with Michonne. He is accepted. That's so crap. hard. That's so true. God, I hated this when scene. Gaitis this scene was Rick so about if freaking. Was the only reason mm. he chose to stay. She jokingly implies that she is why Rick stayed behind. But I, I thought for a second that Rick was true. Reasons for staying at the CRM. Rick Grimes is a fighter. I feel like if he still wanted to go home, he'd stop at nothing to do so. Him accepting defeat and sending Michonne back home makes me wonder if part of him wants to stay. After the death of Akafor, Rick may feel like the CRM needs him. He may think that the place he can do the most good is at the CRM. During his conversation with Jadis, Rick says, You people are a resource. Just like Negan said to her in episode 808, like we mentioned earlier. And man, I hope these shared quotes are subtle hints that Rick and Negan are going to reunite in a future crossover series. Bringing together Daryl, Maggie, Negan, Morgan, Carol, and others with Rick and Michonne. God, that'd be great. Great, 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 great. And oh my God, guys, this is our new favorite Rick side eye ever. The Walking Dead is full of awesome Rick Grimes snake eyes, but the sassiness behind this look was one of a kind. God. So now I want to talk about how Rick and Michonne have grown apart. It's been more than six years. Oh That's a long time God. to go without seeing or speaking to someone. And in this apocalyptic world, it's all about adapting to stay alive. Before the world fell, I'm not so sure that Rick and Michonne ever would have found one another. With Michonne being a lawyer and a woman of color and Rick being a white small town sheriff's deputy, the systemic societal norms of a place like rural Georgia likely would have never allowed the two to discover their romantic feelings for one another. But in a world where mankind was forced to band together, all of these arbitrary and outdated social norms faded away it was also rick and michonne sh well yeah well that's why actually there is this crazy and um, amazingly basic benefit of the apocalypse is the hippocratic societal rules that we have all built throughout the history of civilization will all disappear and we would all end up just the same thing again humans trying to survive how crazy it sounds an apocalypse would be the fastest way to bring world peace. <laughs> it's so crazy to say it, but it's so freaking true. That's why, oh, that's why humans are so weird. Because cause it happens as well in, in real life in the world. The worst moments in history is what brings humanity together the most. So an apocalypse, we would be united like we're the freaking one country. One, one people. I don't know. 
shared experience of survival and loss that brought the two together. But now it's been six years and the two have had very different experiences over that time. Experiences that may have resulted in the two growing apart. Maybe their love was actually a love of circumstance and now those circumstances have changed. Next, we see Michonne meet the artist who drew these pictures of Michonne and Judith on the old God, this screens. scene made me tear up. Yeah. This scene yeah. had me in tears. And this was nice to see because I did always wonder when Rick all of a sudden became an artist. Draw your pictures. I also like that we got a mention of Carl. There was a boy, he asked me to draw. Yeah, when he mentioned I Carl, I was dead. This line about Michelle saving Rick was a fun callback to season two. You emerge from the woods and save someone very important. It was in the season two finale that Michonne did randomly emerge from the woods and saved a pretty important person. Wow. Oh my God, that's such a great callback. I remember in this comic, finale. It was Andrea who would go on to become Rick's love interest after the death of Lori, but in the show, it was Michonne. And then we got a call back to season one when Thorne gets Michonne in her sights and almost. I forgot the about this. This was such a good callback. This reminded me of this scene from season one when Rick and This Shana was such a good. Oh, I remember Rick watching this for the first the time. On his best friend. This also, was crazy. Lori for himself. Only this time it wasn't Rick in the sights, it was Michonne. In season one, it was Lori and Shane who had developed a bond. And then Rick did what seemed impossible and returned. The bond between Rick and Lori had strained the bond that had developed between Shane and Lori and vice versa. The same thing is being paralleled here with Rick, Michonne, and Thorne. Rick and Thorne have developed a close Bond, and now Michonne has done the impossible and found Rick, the same way that Rick found Lori and Carl. <laughs> Michonne and Rick's bond is a threat to the bond between Rick and Thorne and Rick and the CRM. In season two, Rick had to put an end to this strained relationship and the damage it was causing and kill his best friend. <laughs> Not me. You did the job. So I'm wondering if we're again going to see Rick have to kill a friend, that friend being Thorne, so that he can save Michonne. Or will he raise his gun to Michonne to save Thorne? Ooh, hot twist. And speaking of Rick threatening Michonne, next we got this line. Get you the hell out of here. If I have to knock you out, I'll put you on that goddamn boat myself. Rick threatening to knock Michonne out and send her home reminded me of when Michonne knocked out Rick in season five. I'm not going to stand by. I Michonne knocked Rick out for his own good. She was saving him from doing something he'd regret and doing something that would threaten the safety of his children. And Rick feels like he'd be doing the same thing here for Michonne. He'd be saving Michonne from the clutches of the CRM and returning her home to their children. But then Rick took it a step further and said this. It's over. Everything we had is broken. And guys, this line hit me hard. I could feel the heartbreak in Rick's voice and I could see it in Michonne's eyes. But the question is, does Rick really believe what he's saying? Or is this another attempt at him trying to do or say whatever he can to convince Michonne to leave? I think it could be a little bit of both. Rick is in a tough position. Both of them getting home does seem impossible, but the Rick we know does not accept defeat. I told you already, I'm gonna kill you with nothing is gonna change that nothing. When Rick says he belongs to the CRM, I think he might mean it. He may truly believe that his place is at the CRM now. No, it is, it, it is he true. Is to snap he did to mean reality. it. And Perfect. that is why this CRM, I will stand by it. I don't think the CRM had any impact. Had any, I think CRM had the most significant impact a villain had on Rick throughout the entire series. Because I don't think there was a villain that broke him like any other villain did because the they literally broke him no villain ever drove him close to taking his own life that can't be argued that can't be taken because he they kept him away from his family they broke him mentally like no one ever ever could there goes gravity very good high five so she throws them both out of a helicopter this was so gangster this was Michonne so gangsta. throwing herself and Rick out of the helicopter symbolizes her pulling Rick away from the CRM and literally bringing Rick back down to Earth. The helicopter took Rick away. That is from the fastest way family. to take him and away now, from CRM. Now, is taking Rick away from the helicopter, aka the CRM. The CRM stole Rick, and now she is stealing him right back. So, guys, those are all the Easter eggs we found in this week's episode. Big, big, major shout out to Colton Ogburn, the writer of this video. You can find his social links below. So, what did you guys think of the episode? Let me know down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. Smash that bell for alerts. For